and welcome to my talk, Fast and Fault Tolerant. I've actually left a couple of words out of this title. What I'm going to be talking about today is the construction of services that are fast and fault tolerant, but also stateful. What do we want to cover? Well, I've mentioned fast and fault tolerant, so up front I really need to give a couple of definitions of those things. Then I'm going to dig into the core of the talk. And what we're going to be talking about mostly is replicated state machines. If you've never heard of replicated state machines before, great, you're in the right place. If you have, then hopefully some of my experiences with building systems this way over the last sort of 10 to 15 years will help you give, maybe give you some additional insights into their use. We'll jump into some potential implementation pitfalls and some of the traps that you can run into with them. Then I'm going to roll back to some of our initial definitions of fast and fault tolerant and see how this approach compares. And then I'm going to finish up with maybe a few practical tips and tricks if this sort of thing interests you and what you want to start building your own. So fast, but how fast? Well, I've used this kind of soft definition of saying faster than using a database. But what I really mean by this is that it's faster than perhaps the conventional approach to building a service. Certainly it's been my experience in the past, and certainly when I encounter other developers throughout the industry, Typically, when you want to build some sort of stateful service, you write your application logic in your favorite programming language, or probably somebody else's favorite programming language, and you externalize the state relating to it. So building a service this way has some necessary overhead. You have some sort of cost in terms of serializing your messages to this data store, wherever your state is stored. Or you probably end up with some sort of network latency if you're accessing some, sort of, accessing some sort of remote database. So we're looking for an architectural model that tries to avoid some of these costs, tries to remove the serialization overhead, tries to remove this additional latency of communicating to a separate data store. Faults. Well, what do I mean by a fault? What does it mean to be fault tolerant? Well, in most distributed systems research, we can classify faults as one of two types. We've got what we call a fail-stop type fault. This is where some part of your system, be a service or a node or something like that, simply stops responding. We send an input, we get nothing in return. It just becomes a black hole. This could be the result of a segmentation fault, a software bug, it could be a hardware failure, or it could be some sort of network partition. We don't really know. The other type of fault is called Byzantine. This is when a service or a component or part of your system continues to work, but it sends the wrong information. It sends stuff that's weird. Now this could be unintentionally weird. It might be the result of a software bug or data corruption, misconfiguration. Or it could be unintentionally weird. It could be the result of a malicious actor in your system that's compromised one of the nodes and is trying to further damage the rest of the system. So to be fault tolerant, means that in the face of some number of these types of faults in your system, the system continues to run and return correct results to your users. So what now on to replicated state machines. So I've brought up an interesting paper here. This paper was produced in the proceedings of the ACM in 1990, and it talks about gaining fault tolerance by building state machines, or by building replicated state machines. The reason I wanted to highlight this particular paper, in itself it wasn't particularly groundbreaking, it simply aggregated a lot of stuff that had come before it, but it was to indicate this is not a new concept. This is an idea that has been around for literally decades. So what is a state machine? What do we actually need in order to build one? Well, it consists of three things. The first thing we need is a set of state variables. This is essentially the data for our service. This can be as simple as an in-memory counter, or could be as complex as an object model for a, fi a financial exchange, including order books, orders. Or maybe if we're trying to build an online auction site, it's got the information around accounts and auctions and bids. The second thing we need is a set of serializable commands that can be written to an ordered log. And the third part is we need a suite of deterministic logic 
that can be used to apply those commands to a set of state variables. And the key word here is deterministic. It's determinism that gives us the fault tolerant behavior. For example, if our service crashes at some particular point and we want to recover it, we simply need to restart it, load in some, the same initial values for the state variables, and then reapply the ordered log of commands using the deterministic logic. That means we will be in the same state that we were in when we failed. If our fault tolerance requires us to have redundant copies on multiple machines, then it's simply an exercise of ensuring that we have the same initial state variables and then a copy of a log on that machine. We then reapply the deterministic logic and we have the same state across multiple machines. We have an optimization here. We have a thing called a snapshot. So the idea of a snapshot is we capture all the state variables at a point in time, along with a reference to the position that it's up to within the log. So that means if we need to recover the system, instead of having to replay the entire history of the service, we simply need to load the latest snapshot and replay forward from its associated position in the log. So that seems all reasonably straightforward. We're just taking in messages and applying updates to state and memory. But there are some tricks and there are some things that can catch you out. And the key thing is we need to maintain this determinism invariant. And this restricts what you can do inside of your deterministic logic. First off, you can't do arbitrary forms of I.O. You just can't go reading from a file or make a blocking network request out somewhere else. How do you know that file is going to have the same data in it up front as it did when you replayed your state or replayed your log? How do you know that that service is always going to return the same information? How do you know you're always going to be able to reach that service? All these things can break determinism. Random numbers, almost by definition, are non-deterministic. And time. You can't go simply reading the clock of your service. You have to find ways to bring these, this sort of information into your system in the form of commands that can be serialized and recovered. Snapshots. Snapshots are kind of interesting. On the surface, they seem reasonably straightforward. But you can run into some interesting quirks with them. And I've talked about here data structure selection. So one particular case I've run into is iterating over collections and potentially the iteration being non-deterministic. Let's start with an example. If you imagine you've got the case where you're taking a snapshot every evening. Now during the day, what you could have is several thousand transactions and maybe one part of your state variables is a hash map. And this hash map is going to grow throughout the day and then shrink back down, maybe to several thousand values and back down to say three or four at the end of the day. There's an interesting subtle behavior difference between a hash map that we've created by loading the associated snapshot with three or four elements and the hash map that's grown to several thousand and then back down to a few at the end of the day. If you iterate over it, specifically with something like Java's java.util.hashmap, you'll get those elements come out in a different order because the capacity of the underlying data structure changes it. So you need to think about those sorts of behaviors with your collections and what you might need to do. You might need to pick an ordered collection, or you might need to be defensive, take the data out and sort it before iterating over it to give you the deterministic behavior. You also need to think about your application logic as being non-blocking or asynchronous. I mentioned before, we can't do blocking synchronous remote calls to other services. But it's entirely possible that when we receive a request, we don't have all the information we need to service it. So we need to think about how would we design for that. Imagine we have an account and we receive a request for some information relating to that account, but we don't have all the information we need inside of our state variables at that point in time. What we can do is send an asynchronous message out to some other service that will provide that data. But because we don't have the response immediately, we need to take that request, put it into some sort of pending state, then go on processing the rest of the messages in the log. At some point in the future, we will have the response come back from that asynchronous service as a command in the log. And when we receive that, we can use that to look up the associated pending transaction 
unwind it and send the appropriate response to the user. But built into this, we also need to think about, well, what happens if that service never responds? So we usually also need to have timeout logic. So if it waits too long, it needs to reject the request to the user or retry the request to the remote service. Also, if we've received other requests for that same entity, what do we do with them? Do we simply reject them or we could we build an in-memory queue and unwind them when we get the necessary information? Up to you to decide, but you have to think about things in this non-blocking asynchronous manner. Next question is, is this sort of approach suitable for all types of applications? A big constraint here is that we're building a purely in-memory system. So it may not be appropriate for services that are going to accrue large amounts of historic data over time. However, we might be able to think about these sorts of problems as a service as a whole or a system as a whole and how we break down the various aspects of our system. Let's think about the example of this online auction. There's certain parts of an auction service that we want to be fast, specifically bidding on a live auction, especially those last few minutes when you get a flurry of bids just before it completes. But the process of looking at the history of old auctions probably unlikely to have the same sort of SLA requirements. So therefore our live auction system, once an auction completes, does it care about it? It doesn't need that information in order to service bids on other auctions. So it could export that data, evict it from its memory state and send it to another service. It could just be written in a traditional fashion with a database or something similar. And you could service historic requests off a completely different service rather than the high performance of it live auction system. So the interesting thing about this approach is it forces you to think a little bit about your system holistically and what parts of it you care about and what parts of it need to be fast and the various performance requirements. And then finally, it's also worth considering what happens when things go unexpectedly wrong. Imagine you've received a request and you're part way through updating several bits of state and you get a null pointer exception you've got effectively some corrupt state in your system now. How do you deal with that? Well, I worked on a system for many years, very successfully, which focused on just doing lots and lots of upfront validation and lots of automated testing. It worked pretty well. It wasn't bulletproof. We did have the occasional failure and production downtime and manual fixing to repair that state. However, other approaches, if you're familiar with functional programming, and the concept of persistent collections, you can look at an immutable model. So that the idea is that when you go to update the state, you're updating a path through the system. And then at the very end, when your request completes, you're just replacing the reference at the very top of your domain model. The final approach I've seen used reasonably successfully is representing state almost like an in-memory table. So that whenever you receive a request that updates something, then you can take the existing values and represent them in an in-memory redo log style structure. So that if your transaction or request fails unexpectedly, you can take all the changed values back and restore your state that way. Each of these have different performance trade-offs and different quirks, and whichever one you choose needs to be appropriate to your system. So now we've understood them a little bit, let's go back and have a look at what I talked about at the beginning. Look at talk about the definition of fast. Well, my key constraint, the key thing I was looking for in order to make something fast was removing these serialization and latency costs. And well, yes, they fundamentally do that. It's purely an in-memory system. It works directly off the requests, updating a memory state. We've co-located the logic and the data associated with that logic. So we have by design removed those latency and serialization costs. But there are other things. We've made the system, it's required to be non-blocking. And what's really interesting about non-blocking asynchronous systems is just how fast you can make them when you're not blocking on I.O. To give an example, I worked on a platform that at the very edge, from a customer perspective, we were able to hit tens of thousands of transactions per second with less than 100 microseconds latency, with every single one of those transactions passing through the same single thread. So it's remarkable the levels of performance you can get when you're non-blocking and you're using very few threads. They have minimal amounts of I.O. The only amount of I.O. that we actually need to perform is some sort of storage of the incoming command. 
it might be just to a file or it might be to a copy to another machine. And even if the performance of a single thread is not enough for you, you can think about how you separate out the parts of your system. If you have logically different functionality, they might exist as two separate services and may need to message between each other if they need to share information. Or if you have a large number of entities that they run independently, you could look at partitioning on some sort of key to shard those across and then scale those across multiple threads or even multiple machines. So I think we've ticked the fast box. What about fault tolerance? Well, you've got a, quite a range of different options here. If you only care about a single node, then you only need to write to a file, and if the system crashes, you restart and you reread the file. But if you want to take a step beyond that and provide some redundancy, you could look at a very simple primary-secondary model with a warm standby. And if your primary fails, you could start up a warm standby. You simply copy, when you receive the request, you copy it to the secondary, and when you get the acknowledgement back, you then go on with processing the request. But where it gets interesting is when you start to look at some of the academic research into things like distributed consensus algorithms. Because one of the fundamental threads through them is they are all based around the idea of managing a replicated log for a deterministic state machine. If you care about fail-stop type faults, then you might want to look at one of those first three algorithms. We've got Raft, we've got View Stamp Replication, we've got Paxos. All three of those are designed to provide distributed consensus and fault tolerance in the space of fail-stop type faults. But perhaps you want more than that. Maybe you want to be able to deal with Byzantine errors or Byzantine faults. You might want to look at practical Byzantine fault tolerance, which is able to cope with nodes that start doing strange things. But again, that same algorithm is based around the idea of state machine replication, about replicating a log that feeds a deterministic state machine. So that covers a lot of what I wanted to talk about, about state machines and about replication, fault tolerance, and performance. Now, I want to just a couple of little things if you like this sort of idea and you're interested in trying to build your own service. Some of the very simple implementations are reasonably easy to write. If you just wanted to do a file-only implementation or a primary-secondary, in terms of learning about how these sorts of things work, you could do that quite easily without even stepping outside the standard library for your own favoured programming language. However, if you're interested in distributed consensus, it might be worth having a look at Raft and the Raft website. They have a range of different implementations of, Raft, of the Raft algorithm. I did want to highlight one here. And in the interest of full disclosure, this is a project that I spend most of my time working on. My work there is sponsored by a company called Adaptive Financial Systems. And they use Aeron Cluster to build bespoke solutions for financial services companies, brokers, exchanges, trading platforms, and that sort of thing. But the reason I wanted to highlight it is that most of the other implementations tend to be a technology component for something else. They're there to support a key value store, a database, or a configuration management system. Aeron Cluster is designed primarily for users to build their own state machine-based services. You essentially have a container which you run your service inside of, you have hooks for taking snapshots. It's a very fast, fully asynchronous implementation of the fast Raft algorithm. And also over and above that, it supports high resolution scheduling, which is really important for most systems. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about today. What I really hope that people get out of this is a little bit of interest and a little bit of a spark into thinking about alternative approaches to building systems and not always building systems the same way. Maybe adding just one more tool to your belt when it comes to designing your own implementations. Thank you very much.